falsehood in order to come to a belief that the Torah Shroud is authentic. We can take these writings and these academic teachings and we can use them to support the authenticity of the Shroud. But you will see a lot of people who will say, uh, Mr. Nicolotti, Dr. Nicolotti, uh, he wrote a whole book on why the Shroud is not the Mandelian, so I don't want to hear anything he has to say. Uh, but we're missing something because within his writings, there are sections of his writings which prove or help to prove authenticity. So I, I want to keep that in mind because I, I think that if you come to a Shroud conference quite often, uh, my disappointment sometimes is that there is a dearth of citation of academic authority. And believe me, these people know what they're talking about, whether they're historians or artists or you know, anything along those lines. It's just that they take what they have, and as we often see in politics today, they twist what they have in some way. But there's a basic truth sometimes that we can find in what their writings are. Uh, the second thing I would say preliminarily, because I can get through this uh, presentation uh, as quickly or slowly as I have to, uh, is that um, uh, this was mentioned by Bob Siefker. There is a split of opinion, you should know that, on what cloth was the Shroud of Turin. And if you got involved in Shroud uh, studies 40 years ago, uh, the person whose book you read was Ian Wilson. And Ian Wilson came up with what's called the Mandelian theory, and he identified the Shroud as the Mandelian, and Mario just spoke about that. And I was an adherent and believer in the Mandelian theory for uh, up until 2010, up until Wilson's last book. So there's a lot of sense that goes into it. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, things about it that if you study it and you study what the academics are saying about it, it's a very, very difficult theory to subscribe to. Uh, and unlike the uh, Saint-Chapelle theory, which uh, Mario promotes, every time there's been a criticism of the Saint-Chapelle theory, Mario has come forward and he's confronted it and he's dealt with it. And some of his responses are excellent. Ian Wilson hasn't done that. His theory has been under attack for 40 years. Uh, and Mario mentioned, you know, five of the academics that have attacked it. I could name six more. I did at St. Louis. And he does not come forward and defend his theory. And in the lack of a defense, the theory becomes increasingly weak. And so I developed the theory I presented at St. Louis in which the shroud is not the Mandelian. It's another cloth, it's called the image of God incarnate, which is certified to be in uh, Constantinople as of 574. And all these images that you're seeing, uh, Emmanuel presented some of them, a lot of these are Byzantine images. In other words, they came from Constantinople. So you'll see coins, and you'll see Pantocrator icons, You'll see the icon from um, St. Catherine's. Uh, these are all Byzantine sites. And if you're a historian, what you, what you realize is that in Edessa, it was conquered by the Muslims in 639. And there was a break of diplomatic relations between Constantinople and Edessa. Uh, and therefore, there was no one that could go to Odessa and study the image that was there. And these coins and these icons are in such detail, someone had to be looking at the image itself. And the image that I think that it was is an image that was then in Constantinople. It was the image of God incarnate. And I'm not alone in that because, again, there is a lack sometimes in Shroud studies, of studying the academics. And there is a historian by the name of Edward Gibbon, he's one of the most famous historians of all time, he's English, who said that the archetype for the Christian images that were appearing is the same archetype that was mentioned in a writing of a Byzantine historian from the 7th century. And if you look at that historian's works, he identifies what we call the archetype 
the model for all these shroud images, the archetype, according to Edward Gibbon, is the image of God incarnate, the image that is in Constantinople, not the image that is now in Muslim Odessa. So I just want you to know that uh, in, I guess, in the vocabulary of uh, Dr. White, we have different epistemologies here. And there are differences of approaches. And it doesn't mean that somebody's right or somebody's wrong, but there are differences, and some of them are highly intellectually and academically based. But what we need in syndonology, which I think she was trying to make the point, we need some open-mindedness. Because every one of these other theories can be fit into the cloth being the image of God incarnate. So all the iconography we see can be icons that the Byzantines are basing on the image of God incarnate. And the shroud that goes, if the Saint Chapelle theory is correct, the shroud that goes to Saint Chapelle can be the cloth that was the image of God incarnate. So I don't want to speak any more about that, but I ask you, if you're interested, go to my St. Louis paper. It's called Modern Scholarship and the Turin Shroud, or the Shroud of Turin. And you can read all about this. But just so you know that th there is a difference, and that's what the, the differentiation is. I hope sometime we could have a conference where this could be debated. Maybe to a certain degree we could talk about it tonight on the panel. But it is something uh, that uh, is really needed, I think, in Shroud Studies, because I think it was Bernard Shaw saying that the only thing worse than ignorance is false information. So you don't want to be dealing with false information. Okay, so we'll get to the subject at hand, and that is that regardless of what the, what the shroud originally was, uh, 1204 came and the Crusaders uh, came into Constantinople, sacked the city, and that cloth disappeared. And the next time that we see that it showed up is in 1355 in Lyrae. So what transpires uh, in that 150 years, and specifically, how does Geoffrey de Charnay uh, acquire the shroud? If we, can, if we can determine that, we've solved the, the mystery of the missing years, and we've given the shroud uh, a history that it doesn't have now. And what I did uh, is, in preparation for this conference, I wanted to look at all of the missing year theories. Uh, quite frankly, I was surprised how many of them there are. There are actually 15 that have been de developed over the last 155 years. Uh, let me go a little bit. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself on the slides. Let me see if I can do it right here with the arrows. Okay. Um, so we start in 1203 because that's when Robert de Clary says there is a shroud with a full-length image of Jesus. And if you're a syndonologist and you're open to the idea of authenticity, that is the Turin shroud. It was never seen before, described in that way. And immediately after the sack of Constantinople, it was not seen again for 150 years. So what happened to it over 150 years when it gets to Lyrae? If you start with Geoffrey's life, the life of Geoffrey de Charnay, you will not find a lot of clues. Geoffrey only lived to be about 56 years old. He was born in around 1300, and he died at the uh, Battle of Poitiers in 1356. Uh, his parents were noble. Uh, but they were not wealthy. He never acquired wealth during his lifetime. So you're confronted with how did Geoffrey de Charnay get the shroud, and a lot of people who have written about it and made proposals, they're usually dealing with his marriages. Maybe he married a woman who her family had the shroud, uh, or uh, someone gave it to him as a gift. Uh, I think that's the Saint Chapelle theory. Uh, King uh, Philip VI gave it to Geoffrey as a gift. Um, and there are various machinations that have been imagined to get it into Jeffrey's life. 
But the only clues that we have, um, the first clue is in 1343, when he's 43 years old, the same year that he's made a French knight, he says to King Philip, I want to build a church in Lyrae. And he asks King Philip to help him with the finances of that. And uh, King Philip complies. Now, it's only 12 years later that the shroud shows up at that church. So it's a reasonable uh, conclusion that by this time, Jeffrey has the shroud. Is it definite? No. And there are theories that have him acquiring it after 1343, which we'll see. But that is one of the only two clues that we have. The second clue is that in 1389, the then pope in Avignon, uh, Clement VII, writes a bull to approve new shroud exhibitions, and he says in the bull, the shroud was freely given to Geoffrey. And I actually think, which you'll see in a later presentation, that uh, Clement knows that because Geoffrey told his predecessor, uh, Innocent VI, that that is what happened. But you know, keep these clues in mind because as we look at the theories that have been developed, uh, it would be helpful to them if they came up with an acquisition before 1343 and if the acquisition was something by which Geoffrey was freely given the shroud. Now, there are 15 missing year theories. Ten of them are basic. They're different from each other. Among the ten are four that have different endings. So if you don't like A, they'll give you B. It's like a Chinese menu. And then there is one. The last one that was developed is really a uh, blending of two theories. Very difficult to do, and I don't think it was successfully done. Each of these theories have three common uh, denominators. Somebody acquires the shroud in Constantinople in 1204, then there are various transfers of the shroud, and then it is acquired by Geoffrey. So all of these theories present a chain of possession, starting in Constantinople and ending in Lyrae. And every one of these links is an acquisition or a transfer. Now, I am a historian trapped in a lawyer's body. And so I've always been interested in history, but had to make a career decision to become a lawyer. And when I practiced law, uh, and I did a lot of jury work as a trial attorney, you always look for the weakest link. If you've sat on a jury and somebody presents a case to you, a good lawyer is going to find the le weakest link in the other person's case and say, how can you believe this? So what I did here, I couldn't possibly stand here for an hour and give you 15 theories, because I'd have four minutes each and I wouldn't do them justice. What I'm going to do with each of these theories is kind of give you a summary of what the theory is. And then if it's a weak link in the theory, I'm going to identify it, and I'm going to tell you why I think it is weak. And if that's the case, uh, the theory is not plausible. The, the definition of plausible in the dictionary is, does the theory appear to be worthy of belief? That doesn't mean we're gathering the evidence, but just I tell you the story, and then it's like, can you believe that? So if it's not appears to be worthy of belief, then we will eliminate the theory. And if the chain breaks, if there is an implausible acquisition or transfer, we're putting the theory aside. If, on the other hand, all the, all the uh, transfers and acquisitions are plausible, we'll put that aside for the moment and go back to it, and at the end, we'll see whether the theory is convincing. Now, the subtext of this paper is text, fictions, and forgery because, as you'll see, some theories are based on historical texts. Some theories are based on historical fiction. Somebody made something up, sounded good at the time, they could convince people, and a theory has been based on that. And then uh, some theories are based on a document which is a forgery. So obviously, if we get uh, to the uh, the end, and we're looking at uh, what's convincing, it's going to be more convincing if it's based on text 
than it is if it's going to be based on fictions or forgeries. But even if it is based on a fiction or forgery, I'd let it pass muster for now because the story itself might be plausible. So here are the texts, very briefly. Everyone knows about Robert de Clary. What a lot of people don't realize is that even though de Clary um, made this statement, no one, either Greek or French, ever knew what became of the Cidouin when the city was taken, what most people don't realize is that Robert de Clary did not know a lot. He was a, what he, he was a self-described poor knight in the crusade. So he served in the ranks. And he wrote what other soldiers told him about, and that's how he reported that there was a shroud in Constantinople to begin with. But once the city was taken, whatever happened to the shroud was known by the crusade leaders. They didn't go tell the rank and file what transpired. So actually, in this uh, scenario, uh, Deed Clary, the Chronicle, is not worth a lot. Then there's a chronicle written by a noble crusader, Geoffroy de Valadin, and so he's a crusade leader. He doesn't mention the shroud specifically, but what he tells us is that before the sack of Constantinople began, a lot of people think the crusaders came in and they sacked Constantinople. That's not what happened. They got over the walls, they fought the Byzantines, and the first day was over at about sunset. And then they went to sleep. And during that time, the crusade leaders went and garrisoned the two palaces where the relics were kept. One was the Blasherne Palace, uh, the other one was the Grand Palace of the Bucolian Palace. And once the crusade leaders garrisoned those uh, palaces, nobody got at the Passion Relics. They went through the rest of the city, they stole relics, they stole gold, but they did not touch the Passion Relics. So the Shroud of Turin, if it was the Shroud that uh, was discussed by Robert de Clary, that was safe and sound according to the text in the Imperial Palaces. Then there is a uh, uh, Latin abbot named Nicholas of Otranto. He writes a disputation report in 1207, and he says, when I got here in 1205, I went into the palace treasury and I saw the following relics, and one of the relics that he talks about is the burial, the burial relics, burial cloth relics of Jesus Christ. So he's telling us that as of 1205, the shroud is still within the imperial palace. It hasn't been sacked, which a lot of the um, theories uh, depend on the uh, shroud disappearing uh, in the sack of Constantinople. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, Nicholas Mezzarites. He was the uh, custodian of the relics when the Greeks were in charge of the city. Uh, he's famous for a number of quotes earlier, but he got kicked out the Latins came in, the French came in, they kicked out all the Greek prelates, and they brought in Latin prelates, and he went to Nicaea. But his brother died in 1207, he came back to do a eulogy for his brother, and he says that the, uh, the burial cloth relics of Jesus are still in the city today. So that's very important to know that uh, the burial cloth relics, which should have included the shroud, were still in Constantinople as of 1207. The last uh, document is a little bit ambivalent. In a golden bull, uh, when I think Mario made a reference to this, uh, the, when the final uh, Latin emperor, Baldwin II, sold all these relics to King Louis, um, uh, one of the uh, relics that uh, he had in there was, was part of the shroud that wrapped the body of Christ. And the old-time syndenologists, like Dorothy Crispino and a few other people, they said, well, that proves that in the 1240s, when this happened, the shroud was still in the imperial treasury. And that might be what the text means. It might also mean that when the emperors had the shroud, before 1204, they cut off a piece of the shroud, and that's what they kept in the treasury, and that is what Baldwin uh, gave to Louis. So we don't know. It might be another um, 
uh, textual support for the shroud being in Constantinople? It might not be. So according to the text, if you're going to base your theory on text, the burial cloth relics were kept in the imperial treasury and became the property of the Latin emperors. And these were the Latin emperors. Uh, Henry Peter, Robert, uh, Baldwin II. And so uh, each one would, uh, would live, they would reign, they would get killed, they would die, and the shroud stayed in the imperial treasury, and there it was sitting there for Baldwin II. That is um, Baldwin II. So there are three textual theories. That is, they are theories that are based on these texts. The first one is called the Tusi theory. It was um, developed in 1957 by Pietro Savio. He was a Monsignor. And then by Dorothy Crispino, who was uh, one of my original mentors, a uh, great historian. Uh, she just died a couple of years ago. Um, and that's Dorothy there. And in, in this uh, theory, Baldwin uh, is driven out of Constantinople in 1261 by the Greeks. There's a historical text that says he stopped by the palace on his way out of town and he took some relics with him. It doesn't say what relics he took with him. The theory says he took the shroud. The shroud was still there, he took it, and his um, allies, his biggest political allies uh, were the Tusi family, and he had two brothers that fled Constantinople with him, and in appreciation for their past services and loyalty, he gave them the shroud, they sent the shroud back to France, and so it was in the Tusi family, and Jean de Tusi is Geoffrey's first wife. So she had the shroud, somehow she inherited it, she marries Geoffrey, and he gets the shroud that way. If you don't like at that ending, here's another one. Um, her uncle is a priest, and uh, the shroud goes to him. And in 1354, Geoffrey needs some priests at his new Lyrae church. He writes to the Pope, Innocent VI. He says, would you transfer Father de Tusi over here? And the Pope does it. And Father de Tusi has the shroud in an old chest and brings it with him. And that's how Geoffrey gets the shroud. Now, I do not think that the theory is plausible because of one transfer. That's the transfer from Baldwin to the Tusi brothers. Baldwin was the most despotic and greedy emperor that I think you could ever come across. And uh, I'll be doing a, a new theory tonight in which I'll tell you some of his exploits, uh, and I think you'll agree with that. But he did not get out of Constantinople, and he's flat broke, and the most, ex the most uh, expensive uh, and valuable asset he has is the shroud, and give it to a couple of old political allies because they had done him right for all those years. So that's a break in the link of the chain. Unless you're going to buy that transfer, you're not going to buy the theory. Uh, I think Johnny Carson used to say, uh, if you buy the premise, then you'll buy the bit. So if you're not going to buy the premise of this transfer, then the 2C theory, and there's two of them, two endings, that's gone. The second one is the pawn relic theory. This is by a priest by the name of Paul de Gale. He brought it out in 1973. And he's got the relic in the imperial treasury, but he seems to know Baldwin's character a little bit better than Dorothy Crispino did, because he said that relic didn't last till 1261. He believes that Baldwin went and pawned that relic, just like he did all the other relics, and he got some money for it. And then that lender, over the course of the next century, the, the, the lender sells it to some unknown owner, and the owner has it for a century. And you get all the way to 1355, and Geoffrey goes to Smyrna on a crusade and fights so well in the crusade that somebody gives him the shroud, that had it over there. So there's not a lot of detail, but we don't have to get into the detail and the evidence. Is it plausible 
that anybody would have given the Holy Shroud to Geoffrey de Charnay because he fought in Smyrna. And let me help you out with this fact. Smyrna was a nothing crusade. It wasn't an important crusade. It involved basically a lot of skirmishes. And the historical evidence is Geoffrey never even fought in the main battle because he was back in France by August. So I think there is a transfer here that's implausible and that that disqualifies the theory. Now we'll get to Mario's uh, theory, the Saint-Chapelle theory. It was originally developed in 1998 by André-Marie Dubarro and Hilda Leinen. And I think Mario, maybe it was before that, but uh, I'm just aware of his involvement as of 2012. Uh, and again, I think he restated the theory and he gave it teeth. And he went out and got some evidence that would support it. And much to his credit, he has defended it which a lot of theory makers in the Shroud world do not do. Now that's Hilda Leinen. There's Mario, earlier day. Uh, here the Shroud goes from Baldwin uh, to Louis IX, uh, and a hundred years later to Philip VI, who was the king of France during the Hundred Years' War while Geoffrey is serving in the French army. I personally feel that all of the links are valid. They're plausible. I'm not saying how much evidence they have or how much evidence is against them, but every one of these uh, transfers, including the last transfer to Jeffrey that's proposed, that Philip would give uh, a shroud, or, and actually he doesn't even think it's a shroud, he thinks it's a holy towel, but that he would give it to Jeffrey is plausible on its face. So this is one of the theories I'm going to put to the side. So of three textual theories, I think one is plausible. Now we get into the theories that are based on fictions and forgeries. The disappearance fiction is pretty much what I had mentioned to you before. It's based on Robert D. Clary, and it says it was chaotic in Constantinople, and the shroud just disappeared. Now, if you start with that, you can make up almost anything you want could go to almost anybody in the chaos. And so there are four disappearance fictions. The first one is probably well known, especially if you're um, a reader of Wilson's book, and that is that somebody snatched the shroud in Constantinople. They needed money. The richest people in the world at that time were the Templars. They went and gave or sold or pawned the shroud to the Templars. The Templars took the shroud. They, there's uh, Ian Wilson, and that's his book. Unknown Thief to the Templars. Uh, they take the Shroud originally to the Holy Land. Things get bad for them in 1290. The uh, Muslims have conquered Accra. They have to get out of town, and they take the Shroud back to France. Uh, it was not a lucky time to be a Templar because uh, the, it was a rumor going around, possibly made up by the French king, that they were idolaters, and one of their idols was some sort of head idol that they worshipped. And Wilson grabbed onto that and said, aha, the head idol was the shroud, and the shroud that most of you know and love from my book, it's the shroud that's the Mandillion, you only know the head. So that became the head idol, and um, the king then uh, exterminated the Templars, and the last of the Templars, his name happened to be Geoffrey de Charnay. He was the preceptor of Normandy. They burned him at the stake. But in Wilson's theory, that Geoffrey de Charnay is related to our Geoffrey de Charnay. But it's been 40 years since the Templar theory, and no one's ever made a link between the two families. Charnay was a pretty common name. It means a town in France. So it was Geoffrey from that town or region of France. It's not like, you know, you would have a, a long, complicated name today. But as unreasonable, and we'll get to it when we get to the evidence, all of those transfers are at least plausible. You could see that happening. So I'm reserving the Templar theory among the plausible theories. So we get to a theory that I propounded in 1997, followed up in 2000. So whatever bias I have will be self-evident for this one. Uh, but in the narrative, uh, it's just not anybody that snatches the shroud. 
uh, it's a Bogomo or a Paulician, these were heretics, they were related in, uh, in religious brethren terms with the Cathars of Longdo. And the shroud had been used in Constantinople as a palladium. In other words, it was being exhibited to uh, uh, protect the city from the Crusaders. And if it's the cloth that I say it is, you could go back to 626, and the image of God incarnate was used as a palladium to defeat the Avar. So it was a fairly uh, a well-known palladium, and the Cathars were being um, threatened with extinction, and I mean military extinction, by the Catholic Church. So this theory has the Bogomil snatching the shroud, sending it over to the Cathars in Langdo, and uh, the Cathars are eventually defeated by a crusade in 1244, but uh, three Cathars escape from Monsegur, their fortress, and they take with them the Cathar treasure. What is the Cathar treasure? All we know about it was not something of material means. It was something of great spiritual value. So this theory is that that was the tour in Shroud. For the next hundred years, it went from a Cathar family to another Cathar family. And in 1349, King Philip gave Geoffrey de Charnay, by way of a grant, all forfeitures from Langdo, which is where the Cathars are. Now, one of the things about being a Cathar is you had no civil rights, and uh, because they were heretics. And if they were to die, nobody could inherit their property. So whatever they had was forfeited. So if they had the shroud, and if it was forfeited, it would get, get to Geoffrey de Charnay sometime after 1349. Now, all of those uh, links are plausible. They could all happen. There's not one uh, that you would say, well, that's not even plausible. We'll get to the evidence later. So there are three theories that I think uh, are plausible, and I'm going to run a little more quickly now through the other uh, theories. Uh, one's called the Vastitsa theory. This was developed in 1902 by Joseph Dutile, who happened to be a baron, and that's the fellow there. And uh, he says the shroud is acquired by a Hugh de Charpigny, who was a uh, crusader, and that Hugh gets the shroud as a gift, or he wins it. Uh, it doesn't matter, he doesn't produce any evidence, but he just speculates. And he takes it to Vastitsa, which is a place in Greece where he's made a baron, and then it goes down through his family. And his granddaughter's name is Agnes de Charpigny, and she marries Geoffrey de Charnay's brother, Drew. So, Drew and Agnes get together, they have a child, uh, but then they both die in around the same time, 1326, 1327, and uh, in this theory, Agnes, who's the survivor, uh, gives the shroud to her brother-in-law. And there's another narrative, uh, it comes, it, it, we get to the second fiction, this is the fiction that Jeffrey went on crusade to Smyrna, that little crusade I told you about. He went there because he knew the shroud was over there. So he left early for the crusade and he picked up the shroud in, under some circumstances. Now in this circumstance, Jeffrey goes over to Smyrna and on his way he stops by Vastitsa. And he uh, then gets the shroud from his niece. Uh, so it goes from Hugh to Agnes uh, and then to the daughter, Guilamet, and she turns the shroud over to Geoffrey. Now, neither of those acquisitions by Geoffrey are plausible because this is a Charpigny family heirloom. It's not a Charny family heirloom, and there's an heir, Guilamet. She's never even met her uncle Geoffrey when he goes over there in 1345. So she's not going to give him the shroud, and he's on his way to a war zone. Why would, he, why would she give him a shroud to take to a war zone? And the earlier um, transfer is if Agnes died, uh, and supposedly she had come over to France, again, why would she give the shroud to her deceased husband's brother? She's got a daughter. So neither of these transfers are plausible, and the Vastitsa theories have to be thrown out. Now we get to probably one of the most interesting theories, and that's the Otto de la Roche-Bézisson fiction. 
And this is a fiction that was made up, and I think some other speakers may go into this uh, a lot in a lot more detail. But in 1711 or so, a shroud shows up on the scene. This is the shroud, this cartoon figure that you see here. Uh, this shows up in the city of Bizasson in France. And the clergy there needs to make it seem as if this is an authentic relic. So they make up a story to give it a Byzantine uh, provenance. And they say that there was a crusader who was from that area. His name was Otto de la Roche. And he was given the shroud, snatched the shroud. You can have your pick of the uh, various formulae that have come out. But he got the shroud, and then right after that, in 1205, he was made the Duke of Athens. Uh, that's Athens over there to the right, on the bottom. Uh, so he gets the shroud. His family's back in France. So he wants to send the shroud back to France, and his hometown uh, cathedral is in Bizasson. So he sends it back to his father, Pons, they say, and Pons uh, follows his orders and gives it to the cathedral, uh, the church, but to the cathedral at Bessasson, and there it sits. And that's why there's a shroud of Bessasson when they write the story. It's, it, instead of it showing up in 1523, it actually showed up in 1350. And that's the provenance now of that silly relic that you, we, we saw there. Um, now, what happened was that uh, that uh, fiction went away because the Shroud of Bissasson was one of the relics that got uh, destroyed in the uh, French Revolution. So it should have been buried at that time. But a hundred years later, uh, a fellow that uh, I'll talk about a little bit more tonight, uh, Ulysse Chevalier, uh, came up with the Darcy Memorandum and said the Shroud was a painting. And so the conservative clergy uh, panicked and said, we got to do something about that. So one of the clergymen was Adam Chamar, Frenchman, and in 1902, he says, I've got to give the shroud a history so that it wouldn't be painted back when Jeffrey was alive. So he just goes and he takes the Bessasson fiction and, you know, strike the words Shroud of Bessasson and put in the words Shroud of Turin, and there's your story. But how did it get to Jeffrey? Because they didn't have that in the uh, business on fiction. And so he said, well, the, the uh, relic is there in the cathedral, and the cathedral burned down in 1349. And guess what? Jeffrey was in the area. He ran into the cathedral, and he, he stole the relic. That was a story. The most pious knight in France went into a burning cathedral and stole a relic. That's how he got it. That didn't get much traction. And so in 1929, Nogier Milliger uh, said, I got to fix this. So he said, no, no, Jeffrey did not steal the relic. The woman he married, uh, Jeanne de Vergy, she lived in the area. That's Dom Chamar. Uh, she lived in the area and she went into Bizasson. And when the, when the cathedral was on fire, she rescued it. And being a good French woman, she gave the shroud to. King Philip VI, and he said, thank you very much, and then two years later when she married Geoffrey, he says, here, you can have the shroud back as a wedding present. So those are the business on theories, and obviously those transfers in and out of the business on cathedral are not plausible. First of all, uh, Autant's father died in 1203, four years before the transfer was supposed to take place. Secondly, on the date that the cathedral burned down, Jeffrey's military records have him in Flanders. So he was nowhere near the cathedral. And when the cathedral burned down, the city of Bizasson was ravaged by the Black Plague. So there was no way that Jean de Vergy went into Bizasson and got the cathedral. The gates were, show, were closed up to all visitors. So the Bizasson theory was persona non grata in shroud histories for, from 1902, practically, until the 1980s. Then comes along the forgery. And that is, in the early 1980s, a gentleman by the name of Pasquale Rinaldi in Italy visits a church in Naples, and he finds a codex 
And in the Codex of Documents, there is something called, the, I call it the Theodore Letter. Um, and, right, let me go back. Um, in, in the letter, uh, somebody who uh, calls himself Theodore Angelus writes to the Pope on August the 1st, 12, 1205, and says, uh, Dear Innocent III, uh, you know how nasty the French were. They came in, sacked our city, and stole all our relics. Well, the shroud that they stole is in Athens. And so, uh, in, the, in the shroud world, um, uh, all of a sudden, there was a legal foundation, a, a, a historical foundation, and a legal foundation for the Byzantine theory. Athan must have had the shroud. If it's in Athens, he's the duke. He must have had the shroud. And in accordance with that, um, a number of theories are developed. I think I'm a little bit off here. Yep, something's happening to this. Okay. Um, so, historians looked at that. After the Shroud people got in and they said, oh, we've got to write new theories now. Um, Theodore, uh, the, the Theodore that wrote the letter, his real name was Theodore of Epirus. But he was from the Angelus family, from the Angelus Ducas family. And the letter says, Theodore Angelus wishes long life for innocent Lord uh, and Pope of old Rome. The thing is, what the historians that knew what they were talking about, the academics again, um, they went through the records and they saw that uh, Theodore of Epirus never used the name Angelus uh, until approximately 1216. So that made the letter a forgery. He should have been called, uh, uh, he should have said that Theodore Ducas, then it would be uh, more believable. I'm having a problem here with moving the slides. Maybe, could I get some help? Maybe with that? Um, so while he's doing that, I'll just go on. Um, the next thing he did is he greeted the Pope in the name of Theo Theodore of um, uh, Michael of Epirus, who happened to be his, la his uh, half-brother, but he didn't start working for Michael until five more years. So um, uh, that's another uh, chronological error that they had. This thing came up. Maybe that's stopping it. Let's see if it works now. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, the next thing is, uh, this is a fellow who is not very popular in shroud circles. This is uh, Andrea Nicolotti. He's one of the uh, academics, and he's over in Turin, and he's made a living out of um, claiming that the, the shroud is fraudulent. Uh, but he wrote a paper in 2012, and he actually went out and did some work. He went uh, to Naples, he looked at the codex, and he came up with, in this paper, uh, I think it's eight additional reasons why this uh, document is a forgery. There's no original, it was not written in the style of that time, it was not properly authenticated, and the authentication of this letter, since it was only a copy, came from the 19th century. This is seven centuries after things happened. And he was able to show that the gentleman who provided the authentication needed the letter for his own purposes because he was the grandmaster of an order that tried to connect itself to the Angelus family. You would never, it's a classic conflict of interest. So it's been denied by historians. It's got chronological errors, and it's got eight things wrong with it that uh, Nicolotti was able to find in addition to that. Nevertheless, before all this came out, uh, four new theories came out. I'm going to go quickly over these next two because they're not that important. Um, but now um, the shroud does not go back to business on. It stays in Athens. This fellow is Noel Kerr Briggs. He came out with his theory in 1988. And instead, Autan keeps it with him in Athens. He dies. It's inherited by his son, Guy de la Roche. And then Guy is afraid that um, the Greeks are going to take over uh, Athens, and he gives it to the Templars. Now, why the Templars? 
because the year before Kerr Briggs wrote a book, The Shroud and the Grail, it was still out for sale, and in this book he said uh, he agreed with Ian Wilson that it was in the hands of the Templars. So he was a little bit worried about his book because now he had the Theodore letter, so he just kind of rewrote the ending. Uh, obviously, if Guy Delaroche really thought the Shroud was in jeopardy, he had a whole family still in France, uh, the Ray family, and he would have just transferred the, the Shroud to them. So implausible transfer. I have another funny one here, uh, rather obscure. In 1997, Daniel Raffard de Brienne uh, wrote the Athens Smyrna theory. Uh, there he is. He's deceased now. Um, again, it goes from Auton to Guy, but now Guy doesn't give it away to the Templars. It just goes down the line to his successors, uh, who are Dukes of Rome. Finally, gets into the hands of a seven-year-old boy because his father is killed in 1311, Gautier. So you say, well, where where is this going to lead us? Well. According to this theory, Gautier and his mother fled from Athens to Florence, and then from Florence to France, and they didn't take the shroud with them. They left it behind in Athens or in Florence. Gautier joins the French army. His army buddy is Geoffrey de Charnay. He tells Geoffrey that I got this really great shroud, on the other side of the uh, Mediterranean, and Geoffrey said, I'm building a church in Lyrae, I need relics. And he says, go get the relic. So what does Geoffrey do? Smyrna fiction, joins the Smyrna crusade, goes over, and Geoffrey picks up the shroud and brings it back. Now, if Gautier has the Turin shroud, he's not going to give it to an army buddy. I don't know how many people here have been in the army or, you know, just had a close friend, but you're not going to give a precious religious relic to just somebody that you met in the army. Implausible transfer, implausible theory. Uh, we're going to have a presentation uh, soon, maybe after this. Uh, Alessandro Piana uh, came up with a theory. Again, it's based on the Theodore letter. Uh, and in this theory, which makes a whole lot more sense, quite honestly, than the old business on theories, uh, Autan has the uh, shroud. Uh, he keeps it till he retires. He doesn't die in Athens, he comes back to France. And he goes to the Ray Castle where he was from and he leaves the shroud there, then him and his wife go to the countryside and retire, where they die. And so now the shroud is in the Ray family and there are lords of Ray and the way that things worked in those times, it, it usually went to the uh, male um, heirs. So it went down through a number of the heirs, and what Piano says is that uh, Jeanne de Vergy, who obviously is a female heir and in another family, uh, she ends up with the shroud. And a lot of people who have heard this theory uh, just think that Jeanne de Vergy was an, a descendant of Aton de la Roche, and she inherited it. It couldn't happen, and Alessandro says it couldn't happen. It would take a transfer from the Ray family to the Vergy family. And he comes up with a couple of possible times for transfers, but there's no motive. There's absolutely no motive why the Rays would take a precious relic and turn it over to the Vergies. Other than the fact that they are related, and she ends up marrying Geoffrey, uh, there's no proof of any benefit that's being derived by the Ray family. And I think that Alessandro is on the right track, but he's going to have to come up with something that justifies the transfers. It's a little bit lost because, as you'll see in the, in the presentation, I'm sure, um, there's a chest in the old Ray castle. It's got a sign that says this is where the shroud was kept. However, the, the chest hasn't been dated, but the label on the date, I think Mario came up with this, it can be tracked to the 1950s. Uh, in any event, uh, it, it's just an implausible transfer. So I have to write that off. There's Alessandro, and that's the narrative. Okay, the final one is the uh, Ray Verge Bessazon theory. And this was the last one that was done. It was done by Daniel Scavone, and this is the first uh, Shroud Conference in the last 25 years where Dan hasn't been able to attend. I wish he was here for this. Uh, but what he tried to do 
is, uh, rather hopelessly, honestly, he tried to combine the Ray theory with the Bizasson theory. And uh, when you get to the end of it, uh, he originally has uh, the Ray theory, and the, uh, so the shroud is safe and sound when the cathedral burns down, which makes sense. That's Piana's theory. But then he said that uh, the shroud was in the cathedral, uh, and Jean rescued it, uh, and to cover up her rescue, she's the one that commissioned the Shroud of Bizasan and replaced it in the cathedral. So it can't be two places uh, at the same time. And the theory is kind of um, uh, hopelessly uh, tied up in itself. And it doesn't matter. The Ray theory is not um, plausible. The Bizasan theory is not plausible. So the combination of theories cannot be plausible. I'm going to skip over there. This, that's Dan. That's his narrative. And I just want to tell you quickly about this. I can't uh, t give it the time that uh, it deserves. Uh, but um, Dan tries uh, rather uh, valiantly to save the Theodore um, letter forgery. He knows it's a problem. He's read the historians, and he needs some backup for it. Uh, so you can read my paper, it'll have the details, but what he did is when Nicholas of Otranto wrote his disputation report, it had no uh, punctuation in it. They didn't know punctuation back in 1207. So it's just a bunch of words. And uh, ultimately, though, uh, that's his text that says that all of the relics were in the palace. And uh, a an historian, Count Riant, got the 1875, said, no, we're more civilized than the, those old people were. I'm going to put in commas and uh, parentheses. So he added a couple commas and parentheses, and you could read this uh, text, this revised text, to say the nail and the burial linens, which is set off from the other relics, we later saw with our own eyes. That's how Riant has it. But Riant didn't make an argument of that. He just punctuated it. Well, what Dan did was he came in and he put another comma. And he put it after nail. And so now it's just the burial linens, which stands by itself. And you could read it by saying, and the burial linens, which we later saw with our own eyes. So then he argues that Nicholas didn't see the burial linens in Constantinople. He saw them later. And where was he later? Well, he was all over Greece, but one of the places he was at was Athens. So he uses that as an argument that this text actually supports the Theodore letter, but I don't think you can get there by inserting modern punctuation into a medieval text. And I wish he was here to talk about that, uh, this trip. Okay, I um, seem to be having that same problem again. If I could get some assistance here, because we're getting toward the end. Um, So those are all the theories. To summarize, I think the only three theories that have all plausible acquisitions and transfers are the Templar theory, the Cathar theory, and the Saint Chapelle theory. Uh, but when you want to get beyond plausibility and you want to get to whether it's convincing, thank you, uh, you've got to look at um, some other things. Uh, I'll have to go past that. You can read the paper on that. Okay. For theory to be convincing, we take the dictionary sense of the word again. And that is, is it satisfying? When you read it, when you hear the evidence, are you satisfied? And what factors should you take into account? I've, I've listed four. One is foundation, two is fit, three is evidence, and four is critiques. So we're going to run the three plausible theories through this strainer. Now, when you go to the Templar theory, it's not based on text. It's based on the disappearance theory. Not a good thing. Uh, it fits in very nicely with certain things that have happened. The shroud is never mentioned during the missing years. Yeah, Templars, that would under, you'd, you'd understand that. N neither the Pope, the Church, or Geoffrey ever said about anything about the shroud's provenance. Well, it was held by the Templars. They probably wouldn't, especially the king had eliminated the Templars. It fits with Jeffrey's plan to build the church in 1343, and it was freely given. So Templar theory has bad foundation, nice fit. But its evidence is very, very weak. And I, I cover this in the paper, but it, it's, 
it's got three things. There was a Templar head idol, and that's supposed to be the shroud, but there's no evidence of what the Templar head idol was. And the witnesses who testified to it, no one mentioned the linen cloth. There's a panel called the Temple Combi panel, which um, uh, was mentioned in the, in the theory when it was propounded. And because the panel was on top of the chest and it had a painting of Jesus, that's supposed to be proof that it once contained the Shroud of Turin. Uh, the third thing is the name similarity. That is, we got a Geoffrey de Charnay here, we got a Geoffrey de Charnay over here. But like I said to you, that was a very common name. They would have to prove that the families were related in some way. It's been 40 some years and they've never been able to do that. It's been critiqued by Dan Scavone, uh, who supports Wilson on Mandelian theory, but he can't support him on this uh, Templar theory. Malcolm Barber was one of the uh, premier Templar scholars. He said it cannot be supported. Uh, there's no such thing as a Templar idol uh, of the sort. And even Jean, uh, Jean Maria Zacon uh, several years ago said, I think we ought to just give up on the Templar theory. It really has no proof. Got a lot of uh, publicity about five years ago when uh, uh, an archivist at the Vatican uh, Archives came up with something that said there was a linen cloth that the, the Templar uh, initiates would kiss, and it turned out that the, she misread the word for linen and it should have been wood, so that kind of went uh, out the window. So is this convincing? The test is, do you feel satisfied with it? Uh, I'm not going to pronounce whether it is or isn't. I have my opinion on it. But for something to be convincing, it's almost in a mind's eye. Are, hearing all this, are you satisfied? The next one is the Cathar theory, which was uh, my theory. Uh, and again, it has uh, a bad foundation based on the disappearance theory. Uh, by the way, I modeled it a lot on Ian Wilson, who was my hero at the time. So I kind of took his uh, approach to things at that time. But instead of Templars, it was Cathars. Uh, it has a fairly nice fit. It meets three of the criteria. It's just that the, the Cathars would not have gotten it until after 13, or Jeffrey wouldn't have gotten it until after 1343. So I call it a nice fit, but not a perfect fit. Uh, the evidence have to do with Grail references, uh, a Cathar crucifix that they didn't even believe in the crucifixion, but they had a crucifix which was modeled on the shroud. But you can read about that uh, in this paper and in my past papers. They said they had the body of Christ when they didn't believe in transubstantiation. They didn't give the Eucharist. So what was their body of Christ? And they had this uh, Cathar treasure. Um, it's been around for 20 years. No one's critiqued it. It's either perfect or it's ridiculous. But no one's taking the time to critique it, so I can't give you uh, any information that way. Again, uh, is it convincing? That depends on whether you would be satisfied with it you'll have to read it. You're not going to make your judgment from uh, a two-minute presentation today. And we get to the Sunshine Pell theory, which is actually my favorite theory of the existing theories, uh, because it's textual. Uh, it's not based on any fiction or forgery. Uh, it's half and half on the fit. It explains the missing years. It was freely given, but it wouldn't fit Jeffrey's plan in 1343 because he wouldn't have gotten the gift from um, King Philip, I think until after 1347 when he became a counselor, although I think Mario will address that uh, later today. Uh, and it doesn't explain the silence. Why did the church and Geoffrey not say uh, what the, sh the Shroud's background was if it was a gift from the king? So that's an imperfect fit. It's got good positive evidence. There's a golden bull that said that we gave away a holy towel. There's a writing by the Lyre clerics three or four hundred years later that says Geoffrey was given the uh, shroud by King Philip. But I have to tell you, that's from a document that also says that Geoffrey was released by an angel from prison. So I, it's highly religious. It's not really that historical, and it's several hundred years off after the event. And there are similarities between certain Saint-Chapelle relics and relics that were in uh, the Lyre uh, church. That might indicate that uh, uh, Philip was giving other gifts. Uh, there's negative evidence. Uh, it's never called a shroud. It's a holy town. Uh, there's no reference to a shroud. There's no reference to an image. 
And I'll leave it to Mario, but as far as I know, there's no specific inventory references to a cloth itself, which is odd. And I think uh, Mr. Bart is going to probably give a paper that, uh, that deals with this as well. It makes a few assumptions. The shroud was the Mandillion. The shroud was the holy towel. The French didn't know of the Mandillion, and the French overlooked the image. Uh, the biggest problem I have with the assumptions is the French did know there was an image shroud. Remember Robert de Clery? He said there's an image shroud. Why didn't the these French go into the treasury and look for the image shroud? How do they overlook it when they, because it's folded inside out, now they don't know that um, it has an image? I have a little difficulty with that. Um, I have some problems, uh, a conundrum about when they took the uh, cloth out to give it to Jeffrey, but I'll have to skip over that. Uh, it's been criticized, uh, there have been critiques by these five gentlemen, and there's no agreement. Uh, these four say, uh, I agree that the shroud was the Mandillion. Uh, Nicolotti, the skeptic, says, I agree the Holy Tau was the Mandillion, and none of them believe that the Holy Tau was the shroud. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to skip over this part, but I'll just say this for maybe for Mario's benefit. I'm not sure why uh, the San Chapelle theory needs to be linked to the Mandillion theory. I don't think it has to be. I think that the shroud was the shroud, whatever it was, it was in a reliquary. In fact, if it was the Mandillion, the reliquary for the Mandillion was a gold chest that hung from the ceiling of the Faro's Chapel, not this box that they're talking about. And uh, like I say in the paper, I think that this theory deserves to be examined and appraised on its own merits and not be uh, kicked out by you know, people like me who don't believe that it's the Mandillion and academic scholars. I think it would be taken a lot more seriously. I think it comes from, though, the fact that, that it was described as Sancto Tuella Tabulae Insertum, which sounds like uh, holy cloth in a board. It goes back to the Mandillion being in a frame. Um, but tabula, as Mario has pointed out, really means uh, uh, table, tableau, tablier, a table. And uh, for what it's worth, Nicolotti says that the sense of that written by a Frenchman who wrote the Golden Bull, is that uh, all these words mean a reliquary. So it simply says, a holy cloth in a reliquary. So we have the San Chapel theory. Shroud of Turin folded so its image was concealed, it's placed in a reliquary. You get over the problem of there being two cloths, not one, a Sindon and a, a Mandillion. Are you satisfied? That will be up to you, but those are kind of the pluses and minuses, and I think uh, Mario will maybe try to make more pluses when he makes his presentation. Those are all the theories. I'm hoping that there'll be future research, new evidence, more evidence, better evidence. Uh, and tonight I'm going to present a brand new missing years theory. It's called the passage, uh, the simony theory, the passage of the Shroud of Turin from uh, Constantinople to Lyrae. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to the presentation. So, um, Jack, I just have one question. Yes. Why is it pronounced Mandillion instead of Mandylion? Well, I've heard it pronounced in a lot of different ways, <laughs> but I guess when I got first acquainted with it and I saw Ian Wilson come in and make presentations on it, that's the way that he pronounced it, but I think it's technically a Greek word, no, I just so had, I have to defer. I just remember someone referring to it as Mandylion, and I said, that person is not a shroudy, <laughs> right. not a shroudy. So, um, we're going to